All right. Hey, guys. Thanks for coming today. So Emma and I will be giving you a bit of a chat uh, about some neuro stuff that we think is particularly high yield. I had a look at the um, head and neck anatomy from the other day, which I don't know if you guys attended. There is a bit of crossover. Um, so for those components, we might skip it. And we'll highlight the things that we think are particularly important um, for the via uh, and for the end of year uh, exam. All right. So there's a lot of detail in the development of the brain, high yield, low yield, very low yield, in my opinion. Um, you can go into it. You wouldn't really get much out of it, in my opinion. Uh, again, very, very, very basic stuff. We should know what each thing comes from. Yeah. Right. Uh, the lobes is where things are quite important. That will come up in aphasia where they'll be asking you uh, quite commonly if this person presents with these defects in their speech or repetition, um, what part or what lobe of the brain has been affected. So we'll be talking about that later in terms of what area of the brain um, different speech um, centers are localized to, and you'd be quite good to follow up that on. Um, and then the basic stuff such as uh, occipital lobe being uh, the vision, frontal lobe being um, personality, um, uh, won't really come up too much. Again, very basic anatomy. You would have covered some of that in head and neck. Um, Emma, did you want to do? Okay. Right. Um, so this bit's really okay. There's not that many you need to remember. So you should know, and I'll go through it in a moment. You should know three, one, two, four, and six are probably the main ones you need to know. The rest really don't matter that much. Um, so four is the primary motor cortex. Um, it's the pre-central um, gyrus, so it's part of the frontal lobe. Um, and the things to know about that, it's the primary motor cortex, so obviously it's going to be the one that has um, projects down the corticospinal tract. You don't that tract. Um, and it'll be um, doing the contralateral movement on the other side. Um, I don't know how much... Have you guys finished neuro? Okay. Okay. All right. Well, look, I think this... I'll go through as much as I can. Anything you happen to remember might be helpful in a few weeks, but really I'd just go through this slide once you've learned it because by the end of the year, this stuff will be pretty, like uh, most of it makes sense. Um, so down the corticospinal tract to the contralateral muscles um, and it goes by the posterior limb of the internal capsule. Um, and as I was saying about the numbers, this is Bronman area four. Um, and because it is a output tract, it has a large layer five. So the only layers you're going to need to know are four and five. Five is output, four is input. So something that's sensory is going to get a lot of inputs, so it'll have a big layer of four. Something that's output is, something that's uh, motor is going to have a lot of outputs, it'll have a big layer of five. And if you want to be more specific, it's pyramidal neurons and that cells in 5B. It's just a bit of a buzzword there. Um, so obviously, if you've got the motor cortex, the motor cortex needs to be told what to do, and it's going to receive that from the premotor cortex and the somatosensor area. And I'll go into each of those and you'll sort of see why they're both feeding in. So the somatosensory cortex, that's 312. Um, if you'll say it enough times, it'll really stick in. So 312, it's the post-central gyrus, so it's behind that central fissure, the central sulcus. And as I said, it has a large layer four with those inputs, and it sends outputs to the primary motor cortex. So the somatosensory cortex is um, receiving the signals from the body, so along the spinothalamic tract and the DCML, it's receiving those tracts and then passes that information onto the motor cortex so that it can respond to the body. Uh, Premotor area and supplementary area. Um, if you haven't done much of this, the only thing to really that's going to come up, there's a question that Monash really likes, which is like, um, if you're imagining doing a movement, which area is going to be active? And the answer is supplementary motor cortex only. So basically, the supplementary motor cortex is um, responsible for like um, acquiring new motor sequences, planning motor actions, doing them from memory um, and sensory guided movements. So there's sort of a if you keep repeating an um, emotion, eventually it's not the primary motor cortex that's telling your body what to do. It's sort of it's based on memory, it's based on repetition, and it's not really actively telling your arm you're going to need to do flexion and extension. It's just going to become like much more ingrained. Um, so it's this area that's responsible for the complex movements, whereas a lesion to the motor cortex will be your simple movements. Um, Far less important if you're prioritizing. Posterior prior parietal cortex um, is five and seven. I wouldn't remember five and seven. I'd completely forgotten that by this year. Um, but knowing that it, it's the one that it receives information. So it receives information from your somatosensory cortex, which if you remember, does the sensory 
um, receives information from the body. And from area seven, um, is, which receives area from your eyes, your proprioception. And so what you're basically getting is an image of the body. So your brain is sort of coordinating what your body looks like and then responding to that with its movements. Does that make sense? Um, have you seen this diagram? Okay, does it make sense? Yeah. Uh, the only thing really is that big things. So the face here is obviously tiny in like surface area of the body, but it has a lot of um, space on here because it's important. Um, the motor and center sides are a bit different um, based on what's important. Um, yeah, that's about it. Um, so it is showing that there's a general trend. Um, your lower limbs are on the medial aspect, which is important when it comes to strokes, which Johnny will talk about. Your upper limbs and face are on the outside and it's like someone bending over backwards, which is really important to be able to picture um, going on. Um, the area is based on the intricacy of the motor or sensory role. And the other thing to know about it, do I say it later? No, there's something else I was gonna add, but I've forgotten, so I'll pass it to you. Cool. So you guys haven't done any neuro this year? You have so, Okay, so have you done- Is that cranial nerves or like- Yeah, have you done aphasia yet? Yeah. Okay, so some of this stuff is familiar or cool. All right, um, so this is something that they really love um, testing you on, and it also becomes quite important next year clinically. So it's something to get your head around um, this year. So broadly speaking, um, the main, I think there's eight types of aphasia, um, of which six come up a lot, and two, they'll test you if they're trying to separate um, the average students from the great students, um, which apparently they never will. The main ones you want to know are Brockers and Wernicke's. Brockers being um, when you do things, you speak, when you vocalize, and Wernicke's being trying to understand, thi uh, trying to understand things. Conduction being that um, taking information that you've understood and using it to then articulate something. Um, but the, this is something that they like testing you on. I was talking about before in terms of knowing what part of the brain is um, responsible for giving vascular supply to important areas. So um, Brockers area, I've got a look. Yeah, here we are. Got a look. Now, so Broca's area, frontal lobe, um, and then Wernicke's area, and then knowing where the conduction pathway is as well. They always ask that. Usually what they'll do is, is they'll give you a vignette with someone who is struggling with their communication. You'll work through your differentials in terms of what can and can't they do with their speech, work out which part of the brain isn't working, then remember your anatomy. So it's actually a two or three step question that they usually ask, but they always ask it. So if you prepare, you'll be fine. Um, this is again putting in the Bodman's area. They usually don't ask you the actual area for the um, communication zones. That's more to do before we talked about with the motor and the sensory stuff. Uh, again, this is what I was talking about. This is what you'll use next year and this year. Um, huh? Yeah. So there's pretty much three components to aphasia. There's whether or not they're speaking fluently, there's whether they understand things, and there's whether they can repeat things. And if you pretty much commit this table to memory in conjunction with this image that I showed you and the lobes that they're in, you'll be really well set for any question they'll give you in aphasia. Um, so yeah, and they usually just say someone comes in and they'll describe what they're saying. You know, Barry comes to ED and he communicates this and then you'll go through your differential and say, can he repeat? Is he understanding and he's speaking fluently? Work your way through here. The low yield ones are transcortical. So if there's something that just won't stick, you can all those ones. Um, the common ones that weren't key slash receptive, global, brockers, and anomic less, but they, they sometimes throw it in. All right, basal ganglia. The, have you guys done this? Basal ganglia? Uh, also, just go back. There's like a buzzword thing. So, Wernicke's is like, um, uh, like the W is like word salad. So, the thing about Wernicke's is as far as they're concerned, they're talking normally, and that's the big difference. Someone who's frustrated with their speech and is saying words and having to think really hard about it, they've got broker's aphasia. So they can understand exactly what you're saying, they can transmit that, but then they can't find the words for it. Whereas Wernicke's, they can, they're getting the input, they know what they're saying, that they know what you're saying, but when they try and say it, they will talk about, they'll be saying words that make absolutely no sense, but they think it does. Hmm. That's the important difference. So I think it's called word salad. Yeah, it's just a lack of awareness that what they're saying is complete nonsense. And if you go to YouTube and you type it in and you see interviews with them, that's what happens. They'll literally just be saying something completely random to what they were prompted to, but they'll have no awareness of it. 
Um, so you said this is you've covered this. This is also something quite high yield that they'll keep asking you questions on. Um, these are the components: so quadrant nucleus, vitamin, and then the um, internal external globus uh, pallidus. Um, this is the thing that they'll ask questions on, and it's quite confusing in terms of what excites what and what inhibits what. There's a direct pathway, which is um, stimulatory, and there's an inhibitory pathway. Um, the key to this is to remembering what what parts of the circuit are always the same and what parts of the circuit always change. And if you start off with your approach um, of the cortex will always do this or the striatum will always do this, it will help you. So for example, the striatum always inhibits something. Just you have to think what is it inhibiting and what is the function of the thing that it's inhibiting. So the GPI here, it normally inhibits the thalamus. So whatever you have, you have your input here, either from the substantia or from the cortex, come the stratum and it, come in, and it inhibits, as it always says, uh, an inhibitor. So if it's inhibiting the inhibitor, it will stimulate the thalamus. So that's the ex excitatory um, pathway. And then the one which uh, I'll probably have a bit of a word salad myself describing, because I always forget it, is um, the indirect pathway, which is inhibitory. Now, what we say, we said the stratum always inhibits. And now you want to remember that the subthalamic nucleus usually excites the GPI. So you can just say it is a it augments the inhibitory function of the GPI. Now, when you have um, the stratum coming here, this will inhibit the uh, external pathway, which will in turn inhibit the STN. Is that right? Yeah, although really you can just have to negative one and negative one. No, I love the complicated way. What's the number? Um, so it's just like math. If you're two, times in two negative numbers, you're going to oh, get yeah. positive. So if there's two black things in the way, the direct pathway has two inhibitors, which is two negatives, it's positive. The other one, the indirect pathway, has three negatives, which, as you know, math, negative has uh, will give you an overall negative effect. So the indirect is inhibitory, indirect, inhibitory, and direct is the other one. So it's okay. Yeah. Um, this is things kind of just um, dulled down. Uh, have you guys done this yet? Spinal cord tracks. Okay. Um, you don't need to know this detail. So you see it says sacral, lumbar, thoracic, cervical. If you go to teachmeanatomy.com, they'll have a similar image um, with the more high yield part, which is what part is the spinothalamic tracks, what is a motor tract, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you'll see here that it's broken up into um, the DCML and the spinal cerebella and the anterior lateral system. Uh, high yield, very low yield, high yield. Um, and you come up on this side here and you'll have pyramidal and extra pyramidal. And if you've done um, the drugs on um, antipsychotics or if you've done um, cerebellar issues, they'll always be talking about extra pyramidal effects or pyramidal effects. That's to do with these neurons. So the high yield ones are the pyramidal ones, the lateral and the um, anterior. And these are the, and, and the pyramidal ones are the ones you have conscious control over. So if I want to move my arm and I'm thinking I want to move my hand from this position to this position, that will be um, to do with the cortical spinal tracts. But when I do this, part of my body on this side is going to change its position to compensate for the change in weight and, and all that physics and crap. That's going to be the extra pyramidal tracks. They're these tracks which adjust the way your body moves to facilitate the conscious movements that you're making with the corticospinal tracks. So if you have, and that's why with the, I think it's the antipsychotic drugs that you would have covered at one point, which affect, uh, well, you will eventually, um, you'll keep hearing about once you cut, so, so dopamine acts in different parts of the brain, um, one of which is uh, these tracks and one of which helps to facilitate um, the dulling down of those psychotic events. So you give these, you give these pills to people which are a bit um, unhinged, it will calm them down, but they'll start having all these issues with the way they move. And that's because they're affecting these tracks. So you hear that extra pyramidal and they can't control it because it's the unconscious part of their motor function. So just to quickly review this, you wanna learn this image in terms of where the DCML is and where these different tracks are. But the subtracts like sacral lumbar thoracic and here and here, not as much important. If they ask you that, then they're quite cruel. Uh, and yeah, you'd just be pretty sad after, I guess. All right. Uh, so 
with sensory, sensory tracks. If I'm dumbing stuff down too much, let me know. And if I'm speaking too fast or skipping stuff, let me know as well. Um, so you've got sensory tracks and motor tracks. So the sensory tracks, they're sending information up and depending on what bundle of nerves that bundle of nerves they comprise, they will go from they will decarcate or go from one side to the other side at different points along the tract. So whether it be in the spinal cord, brainstem, head, and the reason why it's important to know which tract decarcates where is because they will ask you and you'll get presented with a patient with certain symptoms, and they'll ask you. First, you'll check the modality. So you've done your peripheral nerve um, clinical exam yet and history and stuff. So you know you're testing like vibration and touch and everything. Um, so next year, maybe this year, I don't know what they do. They will, patient will come in, he'll say, oh, I've got, I feel a bit funny. You'll do an exam. You'll have a modality issue. And then I'll ask you, what, what's the issue? Which, which part of the sensory tract has been affected? Um, and going from the modality, you'll be able to do that. So. What you'll see here with this one here, you have first order and second order, second order neurons, there being an interneuron between the two, which facilitates the communication between the two. So you'll have the receptor out here in the periphery. It'll go out to the dorsal column, and then it'll eventually decarsate um, at the medulla. And then from the medulla, it'll go through the internal capsule um, to the cortex. There's two parts to this, um, to this uh, tract, yes, English is, isn't my first, yes, it is my first language. So I remember it being G for grass. So that's the one that does the lower half of the body and C for cranium. So the top half of the body, whatever works for you, whatever works for you. Just remember that sometimes they'll throw out um, these numbers and you have to be aware that one track starts um, T7 or one start one starts at T2. The function is what you need to be aware of. So vibration, fine touch, um, discrimination and proprioception, um, that, that is what will come up in the vignette in your question. They'll say, you know, Barry has come in and he's got an issue with vibration on his thigh, what's the issue? So first thing you think, which set of nerves is it? So you remember that the one which facilitates that function of vibration is DCML. And then you think, is it cranium or is it legs or the grass? And then you go down and do one of these two. Um, remembering where they decarcate is quite important as well. We all following? All good? Cool, cool. All right. So this is the one that is, is just as important. And this is the one I think does pain, right? Uh, pain and temperature. Yeah. This is the one that they test a lot on. Um, and you need to be aware that it has two sides to it, lateral and anterior. And that's what would have come up in this picture before when we were talking about it. Um, generally, when you're talking about in third year, they usually just lump them together, but they may ask you for the anatomy, as in which is the lateral or the anterior, which facilitates these functions. These decussate pretty much as soon as they get into the, um, uh, the vertebral column. Um, they may ascend a bit, but it's not as important. Spinal cerebella. Um, so remember we talked about those tracks, which um, we talked about on, on the one side, the motor ones being the extra pyramidal, so the ones that you really don't have too much of uh, a control over. This is kind of the equivalent of the sensory ones. Uh, and you can remember it because it's um, cerebellum, and that's the one which modulates so many of those movements. They really don't test this much. Um, but the, the, the high yield points is that the anterior tract decussates twice, and the posterior one doesn't dec decussate at all. Um, Pyramidal tracks, so we were talking about pyramidal and extra pyramidal before. You may ask why pyramids, because I think it's under histology that when they cut the brain and they look at the way the neurons are arranged, the pyramidal tracks come together and look like pyramids and extra, well, extra. Um, okay, so you have the corticospinal tracks and the corticobulba, bulba being the bulb the cranium, the ones to do with the cranial nerves and spine being the ones which come out of the spine to control the muscles of the trunk and the limbs. Um, they pretty much all decussate here. Um, the reason why these don't decussate, I'm trying to remember, is that I think it's a redundancy. So if they get cut, you still have some control over your torso. Whereas with these ones here, you don't have that mechanism. 
Um, so with quarter, so with any uh, motor neuron, you'll have two. You'll have the upper and the lower. Now the upper one is what we call an inhibitory neuron. So it's constantly sending signals down to your lower motor neuron to stop it from doing stuff. Now, what's the relevance of this is that when you're doing the peripheral nerve exam and they have a motor issue or reflex or tone issue, you'll be able to split up um, whether it's an upper motor neuron and, and then you're probably thinking it's a stroke, aren't you? Whereas a lower motor neuron, you may be thinking about, oh, is there a tumor compressing my brachial plexus, a pancreas tumor? Or do I have a lesion out here, um, carpal tunnel, for example? So it helps you think, where am I going to be? Is it MS at the front for, for an um, upper motor neuron or is it something out in the periphery? So that's quite important. And when you think about it, these are the things that you want to be analyzing in your mind. So if an upper motor neuron is the thing that's always inhibiting the lower motor neuron, it goes without saying that everything will be a bit hyper if something goes wrong with it. So hyper hyperreflexia. So you'll be going up to the um, the patient or whatever. I'm trying to give you like a clinical and a preclin idea of how to approach this because it's important. You'll tap their knee and it'll just go flinging up. And it really is like they're about to kick you, for example. Um, tone is when you're moving them. Either it'll be high or low. Spasms. So in the absence of constant inhibitory tone, it's like the muscle just keep getting those signals to contract. Um, and that's where you have spasms. Um, hyperreflexia, epigenic circulations, all the opposite things. Now, we talked before about pyramidal and extrapyramidal, and we talk about spasms and rigidity. Um, and that comes up to do with um, cogwheel rigidity and Parkinson's and, and these diseases that you'll learn or they'll throw out questions for you. Um, for so for circulations, it's a lower motor neuron lesion, as I said before. And if you flick the muscle just a little bit, you'll get, you may see flickering, it's more likely to occur if the muscle, if the that part of the body is cold, and you just have to watch for 30 seconds to about a minute to see. So if you're actually flicking it, you wait two seconds, and then you say, oh, no circulation is well, you didn't really wait long enough. No, although that's good enough in an OSCE, just to flick it. Yeah. Um, and then we talked about spasms. Okay, so corticospinal is pyramidal, okay? So there's two different types of... Um, hypertonicity, there's spasm and rigidity, and the way you test it is pretty much using this table. So is it equal or unequal resistance to flexion and extension? Um, and is it uh, velocity dependent? So when you move it really quickly, is it gonna make it, is that gonna change the way it reacts? Um, so you just wanna commit these things to memory and keep in mind that the upper motor neuron is inhibitory. Um, and in the absence of an upper, a functioning upper motor neuron, you'll have increased reflexes and tone. And if you have a lower motor neuron, then it won't be working at all. So you'll have decreased everything. Is that cool? Cool. Uh, very low yield. Um, if they're cruel, they'll ask you a question. And if the consultant on the water round is cruel, he'll ask you a question as well. I really wouldn't bother putting these um, to your memory. They're what we talked about before. They're the tracks that help balance one part of your body while you're consciously moving the other side of your body. So for example, uh, uh, flexor tone, so we, when you talk about a muscle movement in a body, you may be thinking that you want to extend your arm, but concurrently the opposite muscle will flex. Um, <laughs> don't know if his tracks are working. <laughs> anyway, um, so you'll be thinking to yourself, I want to extend my arm, and then your rubrospinal spinal tract will kick in and be like, okay, the other muscle needs to flex at the same time. All right, this is your... Uh, I'll just get back to two slides. Um, I just want to say the easiest way of remembering the upper motor neurons is upper motor, so everything goes up, you get more tone, more reflexia, and your Babinski goes up. You guys have done peripheral nervous exam, right? Um, so that's good. That'll also help with a bit of the cerebellar stuff. Um, cerebellum is very buzzwordy, um, but it sort of makes sense. So the cerebellum, the few things to know about it, I don't really know how many are in here because I didn't write three slides, but um, the cerebellum, it double decussates, definitely want to know that. So that means if it's decussating twice, it's going to control the same side. So it works with the contralateral motor cortex. So you've got the contralateral motor cortex, the ipsilateral cere cerebellar will be controlling this side of me. Um, the cerebellum receives input from different places. And it's relatively straightforward in the name. So you need to know these three. You've got the vestibulocerebellum, the spinocerebellum, and the cerebrocerebellum. And it sort of tells you what they do. 
So the vestibular system is to do with balance um, and the ear. You know, you've got your vestibular um, something near nerve, vestibular uh, cochlear nerve. Um, so that's the flocular nodular lobe, which you can see. Have I got a picture of it? No, there's a great picture on the slides. You get like all these different circles going on. The one that always comes up is the spinal cerebellum. So your vermis to intermediate. This is the one that's responsible, and this is a really big buzzword um, for um, re. What's it called? Re. What the, I've written it down. Refining ongoing movement. Okay. Um, so if they ever say that they're having trouble, so they can start the movement fine, but then they can't quite control it. So they'll be a little bit sort of unbalanced, um, not quite right. That's your vermis, and that's always the answer. Um, and then cere cerebrocerebellum, it makes sense. It's coming from your cerebrum, going into your cerebellum. So that's coming from your um, contralateral cerebral cortex, motor and sensory cortex. And that's going to be the one that's helping you plan, modify, initiate, learn new movements. Make sense? Sort of. Um, so yeah, cerebellum, ductal decussates, decus decus ipsilateral. The bits that are underlined, just know them. Cerebellum, you get a whole lecture on it. It's by a really good lecturer. That it's actually like... A, about 25 slides and it's worth knowing as much as you can about it but if all else fails this is all they'll really test you on um the other things to know are do you know the danish acronym um yeah cool um i've learned that if you don't know it just learn it by heart um a lot of them are also just the symptoms of alcohol as well so it's pretty easy to remember um the rest isn't particularly important. Um, it's sort of the thing that people who want to know a little bit more can add if you want. It's about the different inputs. Um, if you basically want to summarise that lecture, which has like five, ten slides in it, I know I just looked through them, it can be summarised into those paragraphs. Pretty simple. Um, and the only other thing um, is the cerebral pedunc peduncles, which you can look through as well, but I've never seen a question on that in the last like ten years of exams. So up to you. Um, brainstem rule of fours, have you guys seen this? Yeah? Um, did you get taught it or did you watch a YouTube video on it? Yeah. Okay, so you can watch that as many times as you like. I don't think I particularly need to go into it. Um, they like to know the contents of the midbrain. That's something that's come up quite a few times. Um, and also the syndromes that you'll get as a response. Um, so yeah, you've got your medial tracts, your side tracts. This is probably all stuff you know. Um, not really gonna bore you with going into it again. Um, but your strokes are important. So the lateral medullary syndrome is the one that's their favourite. Um, the thing of uh, it something of Wallenberg, um, and it, you kind of get a weird collection of syndromes. So I'll go through this one slowly, just because it can be helpful. You've probably done it to death, but in case you haven't, lateral medullary means it's on the side of the medulla. So the first thing you've got to think of is which nerves are on the side of the medulla. So um, going by the rule of four, you've got your midbrain, you've got your pons, you've got the medulla. So it's going to be the nerves 9, 10, 11, 12. And the ones that are going to be lateral rather than medial are the ones that can't be divided by 12. So you're thinking 9, 10, and 11. Then you need to think about what each of them does, which ones are the motor, which ones are the sensory ones. And that'll sort of give you your, like, your basic understanding. If you look at the tracks that Johnny showed you, you'll also see which tracks are going through there. The important ones to remember is, as we've already spoken about the lateral tracks, the ones that the four ones that begins with S, most important is sympathetics. If you're seeing someone with Horner's syndromes and some dysphagia, so struggling to, um, uh, what you call it, swallow, um, and you've got some weird loss of the sensation, it's always going to be this syndrome. If you're getting a weird collection of symptoms that don't really go together, they're not gonna try and confuse you that much. Um, so those are the symptoms. Um, but you'll get the same side spinothalamic and the same side 9 and 10 with the opposite side spinothalamic, okay? Um, medial medullary, I saw it on there, but I never learned that one, never saw it. But you can reason through the same thing. It's going to be the nerves that are in the medulla, but the ones that are at the midline, which is just cranial nerve 12, which is the hypoglossal nerve, so you'll get that tongue issues. And then other stuff that are in the central, which is the motor weakness and the um, DCML pathway. Oh, okay, this is gone weird. Um, the cranial fossa, um, it sort of seems like something that's not very important, but for the sake of learning it and clumping them all in together, I would learn this. Find some way to get it in your head and just learn the major ones. If you can't learn the major ones, like you can't learn all of them, learn the ones that go through the inferior auditory meatus and the jugular foramen and the superior orbital fissure. So there's three of them. I would say learn all of them if possible, just because in your... Oh, you've already had the mid-sem. Was it on the mid-sem? Yeah, oh, okay. Well, it'll be at the end of year, so I would learn it. Um, it was on our mid-sem, so we didn't have to go through it. Um, which ones are part of the anterior, middle, and posterior? I know that's part of the anatomy booklet. Never came up again. 
And then knowing which nerves are sensory and motor is pretty helpful. Um, so that's the some say money matters thing. Have you heard that? Yeah, cool. I'd go through that and just know basically what they do because it can give you a really good hint that if a nerve's being impacted but you've lost motor function, it clearly can't be that nerve, so you're going to have to think of something else. Um, the other thing they do like testing you on is the um, sympathetic ganglion. Um, so I would learn that as well. Um, this I wouldn't bother with. And this I did not write. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Have you guys learned about Bell's palsy? Do you know what the sort of important thing to take from that is? How do you differentiate between a stroke and Bell's palsy? Which one's forehead sparing? Why? <laughs> the innovation to the forehead comes from the other side. I think it comes from both sides. Huh? Bilateral? Whatever side. Yeah, it's bilateral. Um, so because it comes from both sides, you'll still get some innovation to it. Um, in a, um, in a stroke, you'll still get some innovation to it from the opposite side, whereas when it's down in Bell's palsy, it's going to impact the forehead as well. Um, are you doing visual pathways? Hmm? Are you doing visual pathways? We can do it. I can do it. Um, okay. How about I just tell you the buzzwords, of, like the important ones of this, because there's some that will never, ever come up. Um, loss of peripheral vision comes from where? Do you know the name of it? So it's bitemporal hemianopia. It's compression at the optic chiasm, and it's usually by a pituitary adenoma or something in the pituitary region. Um, if you've got a contralateral hemianomius, hemianomia, whatever that word is here, this one, D, um, that's going to be your temporoparietal lobe because you know it's going through the optic radiation here. And then the only other one that they really like is macular sparing. It means it's in the occipital region in the PCA. Um, and that's because um, the occipital lobe, it's got a, the macula has a dual blood supply. So if you get a PCA stroke, um, you'll still get the supply to the macula from the MCA. Whereas once you've knocked out the MCA, you kind of screwed and you lose it all. So in an MCA, you'll get a complete hemianopia. In a PCA, you'll just get without the macula. Um, these ones really don't come up until um, next year, I would say. Um, yeah, there we go. And oh, if you're getting total blindness of one eye, that's pretty obvious that that's happening before a decussate, so it has to be in that front half of the face. Uh, circle of Willis, this is your stuff, isn't it? Yes. Oh, yeah, go for that. Have you guys done this? Cool, cool. Um, so the main ones are you want to be thinking about are ACA, MCA, BCA. Uh, I find a good way to remember the ACA as that weird shape is to think of a mohawk, that it follows that shape and goes in between the two hemispheres almost. Um, but as you see here, you have the um, anterior one, which runs along the middle, the lateral one, which comes out to the sides, and the posterior one, which together with the basal artery forms the posterior circulation. That's where you get the Wallenberg or the lateral medullary type strokes. So I just put together a couple of words that they like to throw at you in, uh, in terms of vignette. Um, some of them are, are quite straightforward, but Sometimes you don't remember all of them. Learn them in your own time. They will come up again and again. And it's good to be able to use them when you're describing the symptoms of someone that you see on the wards. Um, or even if you want to demonstrate your knowledge for your global score in your OSCE in the year. Um, these ones here, the anterior and the posterior cerebral artery are very uh, straightforward. The middle one, if you actually Google it and you look, it actually has all these branch, um, sub branches M1, M2, M3, M4. Um, so, really, they're not going to be asking you those questions. And some of these are quite generalized symptoms that you won't really have, depending on where the occlusion is in those sub branches. Um, but you will have for um, the anterior superiority, you always have a contralateral lower limb deficit. And for this one here, you'll have the same thing. You will have macular sparing again. So, when you think macular, you think tunnel vision. So, sometimes they won't describe it in words what they have but they'll draw a picture so if they draw a picture and everything is black except for this small hole that's the macula it's the tunnel vision um and you'd be thinking about perhaps a posterior um stroke there these are some other things the main one you'll be looking at is the fact that aphasia um occurs now depending on what part of the mca you may have brockers or you may have one keys or you may have both if it's closer to where the mca came off the circle of Willis. 
Um, but what you want to be thinking of is aphasia, MCA. And it doesn't matter what they say in terms of the aphasia, but if they're giving you a cerebral artery occlusion or stroke, you're thinking MCA. Um, hemi neglect is one of the things I've written here. It's a term. I don't know if you guys heard that, hemi neglect. So it's when you kind of have a lack of awareness about one part of your visual field. It's a pretty specific symptom, um, and, but it does come up. And just be aware of that. Oh, how do you determine the dominant versus non-dominant load? Ah, uh, yes. That's also relevant for an OSCE. Yeah. Yeah, most of them. I think it's about 90% of cases. But yeah, if they're right-handed, they're probably left side dominant. Hmm. Uh, assume left side dominant, but yeah, can be worth checking. Yeah. You guys covered this, I assume you're the same group that went to the head and neck lecture. Um, so you would have covered this yesterday. You did it pretty well. Um, blah, 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 blah. Again, hmm. I threw this in. This is just a really kind of quick and high yield table in terms of what uh, part of the brain has the bleed, what is a common mechanism, what vessel is ruptured, what's the time course, and what's the demographic. Uh, ventricular system, you want to know um, about the choroid plexus, the way it's produced, and about the general drainage. So sometimes they'll say, if there's an obstruction in this part of the course of the drainage, um, which ventricle will be occluded or uh, will expand. Um, and that's the flow you want to remember. Um, and also you want to remember whenever there's a lesion in the brain, you have um, the venous, the arterial, and the CSF all kind of in a balance where if one increases, another one will decrease to compensate to maintain intracranial pressure. Um, and that can kind of give you a handle on uh, the way fluids are changing in the brain. Have you guys done um, yeah. sleep yet? Right. Yeah. Hmm? Oh, yes. Yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah. So I'll go to a picture here. Um, so you have two types of bleeds. Um, you have an arterial bleed and a venous bleed. So the one which is an emergency is the arterial bleed because the pressure is so high. So you're going to be having those symptoms of raised intracranial pressure and, and perhaps brainstem herniation quite quickly. Um, and the venous bleed, which is the subdural bleed, remember, um, is the slower one, which isn't as, as much of a drama. And this is really a good way of looking at it because it kind of gives you a good idea of what mechanism is involved in what, um, in what type of bleed. So for epi, for, so we all know what the jury is, you've all learned the meninges, yeah, the bone. Um, so epi is gonna be above, and it's usually gonna be the middle meningeal artery. They usually ask that question. They say, is it a bridging vein? Is it the middle meningeal artery? That's when you wanna be thinking epidural and subdural. Um, and this here, this time course is what happens to the person um, immediately during and, and um, after they've left, for example. And this is the demographic. So what was it exactly that you were unsure about with the bleed? <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. No, no, that's cool. Um, so you want me to just talk about this here, kind of? Yeah. Okay. So you have the skull. You have the scalp on top. You have the skull. And then you have the meninges under. Now, depending on whether or not the bleed is arterial or venous, you'll have different symptoms. Arterial is fast expanding. And epidural is going to be the middle meningeal artery, and it's going to be a fast expanding emergency where they'll have lots of symptoms quickly. And if you don't fix them up, you may have a pretty bad. Do you know situation. where the middle meningeal artery runs? Where is it most vulnerable? Do you know? Yeah, what's yeah. that? Yeah, the pterion. So that's usually they'll get a hit to the side of the head, um, and then they might have a lucid interval. Does anyone remember Patrick on offspring? Yeah, so hit his head, came to, devastating, died now, later. That's because it was devastating. I cried. Um, had a lucid interval, and that's you'll only get in about forty percent of epidural. But because it doesn't happen in any of the others, they'll use that to differentiate. So you'll sort of have a minor injury. Might not even remember it. Come to, um, sorry, will remember it. Subdural, you might not remember it. Um, and then you will pretty much just black out straight away. So as Johnny was saying, it becomes an emergency. A good way to think about subdural is it's the bridging veins of the head. And what happens is, is as you old, as you old, as you age, my English, <laughs> not so good. As you age, your brain naturally atrophies and those veins will stretch and they will become more prone to being ruptured. So when you have an old person in their 70s or 80s or someone with Parkinson's um, or someone who's had a stroke and had part of their brain um, 
uh, what do you call liquidative necrosis actually gone away. Any condition that has made the brain smaller will cause a stretching of those veins. And when they fall, there's more, they're more likely to get torn and bleed. So that's the way you want to be thinking about um, uh, the venous side of it. And regarding the anatomy, they'll usually say, um, what is it? Usually they'll either say this artery has been torn. What part of the dura or beneath what part of the dura is, 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 is relevant to this? Um, or they'll do it the other way around. They'll say there's been an injury to this part of the head. What, what artery is being affected or vein? So you really just want to um, commit the, yeah? They also do the biconvex, biconcave. Most often there'll imaging. be a CT imaging in the image booklet and it'll say which type is this. Um, so biconvex is epidural and biconcave is subdural. Um, that's, that'll almost always be there as a hint. That all good? Yep. Cool. So what's the epidural, the one that I was going to yeah. That's it, yeah. Well, the most of it is actually subarachnoid, wouldn't you say? Um, so yeah, but, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you get this from a berry aneurysm. So berry aneurysms are, are congenital defects in the arterial system in the um, cerebral villus. You get them in different conditions. Sometimes um, I think polycystic kidney disease, you can get them, but they won't always have a trigger. So you may hear in the vignette, Barry sitting, it's always Barry, Barry sitting at his desk and then he gets a terrible, terrible headache all of a sudden. It was a thunderclap on set. That's, that's what the word they'll use. It'll be the worst headache they've ever experienced in their life. Um, and there won't be a cause. So you'll hear a narrative for epi. It'll be a, a punch or fo footy play, which gets a hit to the head. Subdrew will be the old person that slips and hits the head. And subarachnoid will just be out of nowhere. Um, you can also have hypertensive crises, um, or you can be a um, heavily anticoagulated. All these things can influence it. But yeah, um, between epi and sub, epi is much worse. Um, between the three, subarachnoid isn't as common, I'd say, as epi and sub, because epi and sub are more trauma. And sorry, it's very, it's very poorly described. Epidural and subdural um, will be more to do with the narrative, and subarachnoid will just be out of nowhere. That's correct. Yeah. Again, this is something you remember. Does this thing make sense here? The way it's kind of laid, laid out uh, into lovely colors, and yeah, cool. Ventricles we talked about. Um, you want to go into, this is a thing which helps if you can see it in a video and not in a picture because it really is a 3D thing. You want to go onto YouTube and type in vent um, ventricular system flow of CSF and there'll be these little animations um, that someone with too much time put together showing you the way the CSF flows and it's much easier. Once you've seen the CSF flow from point A to point B, you're much better than organizing and uh, memorizing a list of the different ventricles and the way they drain. Have you guys done sleep? No? Um, do sorry? Yeah. All right. Well, if you do do, I did sleep last year um, as part of my course at, at Gippsland. I don't know if you guys would do it. If you do, this is a really high yield um, diagram. They usually will ask which of the following things, which of the following um, neurotransmitters or chemicals stimulate or, or block REM. And then this is just a way of approaching it. Questions. Oh, no, this means there are questions. Oh, this means there are questions. There are questions. <laughs> but are there any questions anyway? Specifically, that's something that you struggle with. I suppose it's a bit soon to tell, but is there anything that you haven't understood in the last week of neurology or other topics? <laughs> a lot. Do you mean those, the way they describe it? You mean those descriptions? Okay. All right. So you've got corticospinal neurons, which are pyramidal neurons. Because They're, they go by the pyramids. Yeah. Which is the way they look when they get to the brain. There's the medullary pyramids, which is just a spot in the brain. So the pyramidal trucks go through the pyramids, the extra pyramidal go elsewhere. Yeah. All good? Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. Anything else? Anyone? I guess for that, like, it has Okay, so these ones here at the top, the blue ones, they all stimulate the REM off neurons. Um, adenosine is one which can do both. They won't ask you about adenosine. I just chucked it in there. Um, and then these ones here are the ones which stimulate your REM sleep. Yeah, so it stimulates it or it doesn't. There's different factors which will cause these to um, increase. 
Um, but for the most part, they'll just be asking you which of these increases or decreases in a state where someone's about to enter REM sleep. And you just got to remember that. But I don't know if they'll teach you. Uh, you said there's, a, there's one question that we were never taught, but it just came up on like four or five exams. It's something like melatonin half an hour before bed and no blue light or something. It's that's just more a, hormones. That's stuff, it. Yeah. It's just melatonin and you should not consider the pineal gland rather than the pituitary gland. Yeah. That's a, about it. A big thing you need to understand by the end of this is the whole idea of the uh, sensory neurons. What, what's their function? Where do they decarcate? And the whole idea of upper motor neurons, lower motor neurons, um, what's inhibitory, and what is the manifestation of the lesion, either at the top or at the bottom? Is that something that you all kind of got an idea of? Or have you had exposure to that yet? No. Uh, Do you have Quinton still? We're trying to work out whether he's still here no, or not. He kept, 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 he's not he's doing things by smart drugs and next Great. Okay. That's a good one. Do you still do Digilabs? Okay. It'll be fine. You Focus on those lectures. Lot. You'll get a lot of neuro lectures. Make sure by the end of it, if you have to prioritize something, do the tracks. Okay. Cool, cool. Just keep doing them. Just like, honestly, just keep doing them. Um, I have some questions. Um, I'll go through them relatively quickly. If you can try and give me an answer, that'd be great. Mostly, I'm hoping that by doing the questions, it might prompt you to ask questions of your own about anything. Um, it's worth doing. And also, you can go through this with an explanation. So if any of these you want an explanation for, I can do that as well. So this is what I went through at the start. Which of these best describes the lateral corticospinal tract? Anyone? D, is that what you said? So four six is the um, Brodmann area for mainly four. It's primary motor cortex to the by the posterior limb. Posterior limb is important because there's a stroke question. It's the lenticular striate arteries. If you ever get a question about a purely motor stroke, it's the lenticular striate arteries at the posterior limb. Because as you can see, if it's going by the posterior limb, it's only going to affect the motor function. Um, this is the question. This is just this is all you'll need to know about the cuneate and the gracilis fasciculus. This is just it. Um, so you need to know the umbilicus is T10. You should know that from clinical schools anyway. Um, so he's lost vibration and proprioception below the umbilicus on the left lower limb. Okay. So you're going to have to ask yourself a few questions. Is it right or left for the DCML? Is it the cuneate or fasciculus? And is it T10, T8 or T12? So he wants to work through this step by step. So the umbilicus, what's that? Okay. So one of these two. Um, DCML, as you know, goes through those two fasciculus pathways at the back. Um, and, oh, well, this is, okay, stupid question because it's left or right and gracilis or cuneus. Um, it's a really poorly worded question, but whatever. Um, so it is T10. It's the left lower limb. DCML decussates where? Anyone remember? Yeah. So if you've got um, a left-sided abnormality, that means it's going to be a left-sided problem because it hasn't decussated yet. So you do know it's left. But also because it's lower limb, it's going to be the gracilis. Um, this is just something they like to know. I don't know, can't explain this, so just know that structure is not located. The area that's indicated there is the, oh God, uh, midbrain. This is the question. Um, she's unable to speak coherently. Which aphasia is that? First of all, which aphasia is that? Wernicke's or Broca's when they can, can't speak clearly, but they know what they want to say. Brokers knows what they want to say, can't quite say it. Where is that? Anyone? Good. Can anyone tell me what A is? Pointing group? Yeah, right. Good. And E is that occipital eye stuff. Parkinson's. Have you learned Parkinson's yet? Have you learned the basal ganglia? This is what <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> they'll they'll ask this question in some way or form, either at the end of year or on the flyer. So just learn it. Could someone answer this one here? It's a bit of a tongue twister. Hypo or hyper hypokinesia? What do you think you're going to have more cortical function or less cortical function? Um, so you've got the direct and indirect pathways. If the dopamine's acting, it's going to be exciting them. When you've got no dopamine, it can't really inhibit the inhibitory either. So you get decreasing cortical function. Um, 
this is that question when imagining finger movement, which is the part of the brain becomes activated. Often there'll be a guy who's had a stroke and can't move, but he's picturing himself playing tennis. Supplementary. Only supplementary. Um, here you go. Intermediate hemisphere and vermis. So that's the spinocerebellar lobe. Which one is that? Do you remember? Whoops. Keep it away. I don't know if anyone saw that there. I'm happy to use it. This is the one about refining new movements, and you'll also have ataxia because you can't refine those ongoing movements. That's what ataxia is in this case. Um, uh, what course this? Left homologous hemianopia. Can you just tell me where that would be along the spinal tract? So would it be at the start? Would it be at the chiasm? Or would it be after? Yep. Where are you pointing? Is that an accident? I think he's just thinking. <laughs> oh. Intense concentration. <laughs> Pardon? Um, homologous hemianopia means that half of your image is cut off. Not half like, so which means half of each side. So give you two circles, half of each side. So would it be in the tract? And it'd be in the right tract, sorry. Um, pituitary tumor. This is that case where what's it gonna compress? Wait, what sits above it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so what's it gonna get? Yeah. Do you know what any of these others are? Do you know what meiosis, anhydrosis, and tosis is? I'm gonna test you on this because this will be on your neurological. Yeah. What causes hornets? I love that. Uh, loss of capillary light reflex. How do you test that? Have you done cranial nerve exam? Yeah. How do you test the pupillary light reflex? Why do you test both sides? What's, what is um, direct versus consensual? Which two nerves are you testing? Exactly. So you're testing the optic nerve on both sides and the ocular motor on both sides because if it's able to constrict, but the other side isn't, then you've got to work out is it the optic nerve that's damaged or the ocular motor and on which side. That's my loss of peripheral vision. There's only a few more here. Um, okay, she's got a tremor, a wide base gaze, and nystagmus. Is it? Parkinson's is going to be bradykinesia, rigidity, and hypotonia. Yeah, when you see nystagmus, it's usually cerebellar. Um, it can be peripheral causes, but as far as you're concerned, if you've got nystagmus, it's cerebellar. And when you're doing a gait test, um, I think there's only two main causes of a wide base gait being an apraxic gait and a cerebellar gait. So that gives it away as well. Um, I'm going to be keeping that in mind. Parkinson's gait is a shuffling gait. They probably show any videos of it. Cerebellar disease. Vertigo, right facial muscle weakness, loss of coordination. I thought this was hard, actually. In fact, leave this one. When you go back to these slides, try and by the time you finish your exam, you should be able to understand why this was the question. I didn't understand this yesterday. I went through the notes. I was then able to understand it. So if you study it, it should make sense. Well, what's vertigo? What's vertigo? What is that vertigo can be a lot of things. Yeah. I, uh, There's about what? Cerebella, mainly. BPVV, Meniere's disease. I wouldn't go into it. As far as you're concerned, it's cerebellar. They might ask you about um, the BPV. No. They wouldn't? No. Okay, they won't ask you about that. Never heard of it. Um, difficulty speaking, right side of loss of weakness. What's this? It's funny because this would have been so hard last year. And really? Now, well, I cannot say how, but like, now it's like... Yeah, MCA. If you go into a stroke question, you've got literally no clue. If you've got no clue, no clue, because it's really because you've never seen it before, go lenticular striate. If you just want to back your odds, go MCA. So it's MCA. Um, but you can usually recognize MCA. So if you're seeing something you really don't want to know what it is, it's probably lenticular striate. Um, Wait, could you explain that? What is lenticular striate? Lenticular striate arteries are the arteries that supply the internal capsule. They're a branch of the MCA. And they're the ones that will cause that posterior limb of the internal capsule suit. So they'll lead to a purely motor issue, which means you'll have motor deficits in your face, your arm, and your leg, which doesn't quite fit with an MCA, and you'll have no sensory changes. Wait, so is that a brain stem? No, no, it's an internal capsule. It's after the brain. So you have you have the MCA? <laughs> your brain stem strokes are the ones that combine lots of symptoms. Okay. So yeah. things like vertigo, you're not gonna get in your your brain strokes 
are your motor and your sensory. Your brainstem strokes will affect your motor and sensory because your nuclei start there. But the way you differentiate it is you're getting symptoms that affect your entire body. Vertigo affects your whole body. The nystagmus can affect your whole body. The sympathetics issue, it's whole body strokes. So the lenticular strike, they're branches of the MCA. The internal capsule is part of the brain and it's a white part which has all these different axons going through. And they're very delicate arteries and it doesn't have a very good vascular supply. So if you get an occlusion there, then that's why you get... Oh, they like the body. Gino of the posterior limb. I don't remember what it does. I just remember it was... I remember... I used you can, to know you what can it does. look it up. There's, it there's five types of lenticular stride artery um, occlusions. Um, I wouldn't learn them all because I'm hated for learning them. Learn one or two and know that they're the weird and wacky ones um, that are the entire body. So with the Wallenberg ones, they're just a hodgepodge of random stuff that makes no sense. So you'll have... I learned it as um, hoarseness, hiccups, um, horners, and then the um, dysarthria, dysphagia. They're just things which make no sense. But there is some um, sense to the fact that the whole body is being affected with one modality. That would be a lenticular striate. Does that sound all right? Cool. There was no sensory changes with that. You can get a lenticular striate artery with, um, um, stroke where you get pure sensory change. They're, they're weird. You can learn them. There's... A lot of the things, I mean, when the pace you're in now, just learn, yeah. what, learn what Monash wants you to know. Yeah. And then when you go out next year, you still learn what Monash wants you to know, but you can see other things. Yeah. But if you're really interested in like strokes, just save it for next year. So <laughs> Monash doesn't really care. Um, upper motor neuron, corticobulba, left facial nerve. Do you want to explain this one? Sure. Just quickly, we talked about upper and lower. Um, the corticobulba is the upper motor neuron of, and the cranial nerve is the lower motor neuron of that set that we discussed, okay? And what you want to be thinking is, I also had that last year when I learned. <laughs> what, you want, what you want to be thinking is, before, if you scroll up to the slides that we gave you, we pretty much said that all the um, cranial nerve nuclei, that is where the cranial nerves originate and where the corticobulba neurons terminate at, all of them have bilateral innervation, um, except for two being, what part? Oh, we'll leave that. Another one? Something to do with the tongue? No. <laughs> okay, so that's, those are the ones you want to think. If you have an issue at the corticobulbar level, um, you'll generally be okay for the bilateral ones, um, except for those other ones. And downstairs, everything is just, um, it's like a normal neuron. If you cut it, you won't have a backup neuron coming to help it. Super nearly over. 17, uh, suffered a stroke a week ago. Oh, um, yeah, that was the other thing I was going to say. Um, you get hypertonia, you get hyperreflexia, you get all of those after a period of spinal shock. So Monash likes you to know that originally you get decreased everything and then you become hyperreflexic. But this is different. This is if you suffered a stroke a week ago, is that upper motor neuron or lower motor neuron? So, yeah, so which would you get? Blow to the head, temporary loses consciousness. Why? Sorry, is it football? Is that what you said? Okay, so it's it's that trauma. He's a young bloke. He's not going to have the those veins which are really at risk, and it's there isn't a kind of spontaneous, unrelated subarachnoid narrative to it. Um, his left pupil being dilated and unresponsive to light. What's that suggesting? Anyone know that? Uh, I thought it was raised into cranial pressure. Well, you'd probably have that. You have something called traction. So some cranial nerves are more at risk of becoming dysfunctional when the yeah. pressure inside increases. So it'll actually push against the cranial nerve and you get microvascular ischemia between the blood or whatever the, the impetus is that's pressuring it and the bone. It's the same thing with the pressure ulcer at the bottom. You're standing on your foot. You have the bone at the bottom pushing down. You have the, the force at the bottom pushing up and you end up having that microvascular ischemia. It's the same concept. That, that could be either. Because when it's raised, it, you, so remember we had that CT image and we had the idea that there's midline and some parts of the brain are compressed, some aren't as much. Yeah. That's what you get. So it not, you don't necessarily have, so if you have, let's say you have two nerves running up down like this, mm -hmm. you may have an issue that affects and compresses this nerve, but not necessarily this one early on. Well, so it might be isolated to one side yeah. originally. Yeah. Exactly. And that's what you see in the images. You don't always see one thing affecting everything globally. You'll hardly yeah. ever see it affect both sides. 
if that's what's causing the death because of the violation, it doesn't. No. no. But it will often eventually become a global if you, if you don't resolve it. And that's when it will, um, what do you call it, go through the Roman magnum? A herniation. Uh, and that's when you die. So, so your eyes and feet can be raised on one side. Mm. Well, I think you'd consider it diffusely raised, but it may not be compressing the nerve correctly. I'd probably say that when you have like the main, you're thinking of um, papilledema. Is that what you're thinking of when the when the eyes are like bursting out as opposed yeah, to? Yeah, yeah. Well, I just yeah, I just logically for me, if there's raised eyes and feet, it's going to be side. Yeah, um, it doesn't always happen that way. You also have the dura's segmenting parts of the brain, yeah, compartmentalizing. Yeah. So one compartment may be, another may not. Papilledema. You could use. Lateral. And this is that last question. If you've got um, damage to the descending lateral corticospinal, your motor reflexes will be initially um, lost and then they'll be um, increased or return and be exaggerated due to the loss of descending inhibition. I think the main the questions I chose for this one were to try and give you an indicator and indication of what was important. Um, there's a lot to learn, but there's not that much that they're going to test on. There really isn't. Um, understanding the tracks is important. And then in conjunction with the OSCE, that way next year when you actually find things on the wards and you have patients, you won't just be regurgitating the book out of context because I understand what you said. Oh, and um, use Con um, Talion O'Connor for Neuro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go through that chapter. You'd be kicking yourself if you don't go through that whole chapter for sure. The cranial nerve, the whole nerve exam is really good. That's the best way to learn neurology, I've got to say. Best textbook.